Thank you, everyone, um, for being here tonight. Uh, my name is Juan Pablo Echeverria. I am the Outreach and Education Coordinator for Arcadia, the Center for Sustainable Food and Agriculture. Um, but I'm also the new co-chair for the Urban um, Agricultural Work Group. Um, this is part of our, screen, of our spring workshop series with the Urban Ag Group. Um, the Urban Ag Group focuses um, on trying to promote uh, the expansion of edible gardens in schools, houses of worship, and other community settings. Um, and we do this by supporting and promoting uh, new community gardens and improving existing ones. Um, but I think one of our strengths is we act as a resource to create connections between gardeners and pantries and uh, nonprofits and everyone else uh, in, in Fairfax um, with the intention of uh, having more places in our community to grow food um, and for people to experience uh, agriculture in urban settings um, with the idea that this could uh, foster better health uh, decisions within us uh, and our families. Um, and obviously um, with everything that's happened over the last two years, I think we've realized the importance of having a more of a food sovereignty and being connected to our food and having our food sources be closer to us uh, and not depend so much on on having food come from, from various places. Um, uh, the Urban Ag Group is part of the Fairfax Food Council, um, which is also a coalition of citizens and nonprofits and faith partners uh, and faith partners um, that advocate and promote food system and policy changes uh, for the benefit of our community. Um, and part of what we are trying to do today is um, through these workshops is this is what we think a great way to uh, share our knowledge and share a lot of the resources that are in our community to promote uh, urban agriculture. Um, you know, two years ago, we were doing these live uh, and in person, and we would get about 20 people to show up, which was always great. It's hard to talk to a larger group of people. Um, but now we've, you know, we're able to host 60, 100 people for one of these, and that's obviously helped us amplify our message and our desire to, to promote urban agriculture. Um, for today's uh, workshop, we're going to be talking about composting. Um, and the idea is that you can, you know, learn a few little tactics and ideas on how to have, uh, do and practice composting at home. Um, but we'll also have Compost Crew, uh, which is a locally owned food scrap recycling business uh, that offers composting services uh, for business organizations uh, and residential customers. Uh, in Maryland, Virginia, and Washington, D.C., I believe. Um, and so they're going to talk to us uh, about, obviously, compost, but also uh, what large-scale composting looks uh, in Fairfax, uh, and even ways where, um, as an organized community, we can help promote and kind of, like, uh, encourage our authorities to really make a push. Um, if, if anyone's lived almost in any other state, you might realize that Virginia is pretty behind on composting and, 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 and recycling of food scraps. Um, and I think, uh, I think uh, with their group and their support and their support and the support of other people involved in the urban ag group, um, we're hoping that we can um, really make this uh, just a service that any resident, any business, uh, any school or anyone in the community can, can access and, and can composting be as normal as like separating your trash uh, at home. Um, and so I wanna, um, we also have scheduled this workshop for an hour and we wanna kind of really stick to that. Uh, we feel there's other important things maybe on the news later tonight that might people wanna uh, uh, listen to. Um, and so we really wanna, you know, try to get this done. And the way we're going to do it is um, Christy and Ivy from Compost Crew are going to talk to us about composting. Uh, we'll maybe give a small window for a few questions that are specific about the work they do. Uh, but then we have three people from our community uh, who will share basically how they do it at home, because obviously they're gonna talk big picture and then we wanna give you like real live examples of how people practice composting at home because it is almost like an artisanal practice that everyone kind of does it their own way and depending on like their household and, and the size of their house and how much outdoor space they have, everyone does it slightly different. Um, and then at the end, we'll, we'll make room for questions. Um, and one of the things we were hoping we could do is 
rather than as the presentation is going on, uh, that you type questions into the chat, that you wait till the Q and A section, um, so that we're not, you know, missing anybody's questions or uh, or distracting the speaker as the chat kind of like um, lights up. Um, so I will introduce uh, Christy. She is the organic solution manager uh, for uh, Compost Crew uh, and also a active member of the Urban Agri Group uh, and Ivy Nargis, uh, who is uh, a compost fellow. Uh, and I was just telling her I really like her title. Um, apparently, she's a compost manager now. Um, so thank you, both of you, uh, for being here tonight. Uh, and we look forward to your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Juan Pablo. It is so great to speak with you all today. Um, all right, everyone, thanks again. Again, my name is Christy and I lead our composting division at Compost Crew. Um, before I get into the presentation, I just wanna gauge where everyone is in the composting world, which is an exciting topic. I know we're excited to talk to you all about it. In Zoom, I'm sure a lot of you are getting used to it, but if not, there are reactions. Um, so don't go off of mute. But there are reactions you can see on the bottom of your screen. There's like little up, you know, like clapping signs and hearts and stuff. Um, we're going to try to see, uh, gauge where everyone is in composting. So if you can check that out. If you know what composting is, would you please put a thumbs up in your reactions? All right. It seems like a lot of people know composting, so you're in the right place. There's a couple people that said no, so that's good to know. Now, next question, who is actively right now food scrap recycling? So what that means is you're taking food scraps out of your trash right now, and you're putting them somewhere else, not a landfill, not an incinerator, somewhere else it's getting recycled. Put a little thumbs up. All right, we got a lot of people doing that too, which is awesome. Okay, and then last question, who is actively composting right now? So they're act actively putting their food scraps in a place where it can break down on their property or maybe in a community garden or a school and doing the work of composting, whether it's with worms or with anything else. Little thumbs up. All right, we got a little bit less, but still a, a large crowd. So that's good to know where we're all at. Awesome, well, thank you for doing that with us. We wanna keep you guys engaged. So hopefully we can keep um, keeping you interactive. So I'm gonna now share my screen so we can get into our presentation. So hold on one second. All right, can everyone, can you see my screen? Little thumbs up. Okay, great, perfect. All right, well, thanks for having us. Again, I work for Compost Crew. So let's get right into it. So composting, what is composting? A lot of us already know. But why do we care? I wanna go over a little overview of why we care, um, where our banana peels go, right? When, before I knew about composting, I did not care because I didn't know, right? Who knows what a banana peel can really do for environment? Um, before I worked with Compost Crew, I actually worked uh, in hazardous waste cleanup. So I cared more about you know, where hazardous waste comes from. So why do I care about a banana peel? But I've learned so much of the impact that composting can do for our environment. Um, number one, food waste. So when we put these food scraps in a landfill or incinerator, let's just focus on landfill, it generates methane gas, which is a, such a potent gas that might infect our climate change as we're seeing right now today. Food waste and food loss is the third largest greenhouse gas emitter on this earth more than the whole entire country of India and a little bit less than the United States. So that is a huge part of our climate change is where we're putting our food waste. Um, but it's not just food waste, it's also how we're putting that material back into the earth. Instead of it going back into our soil and helping our soil food web, we're taking it out. Those leaves that fall to the ground, we're raking it up, we're putting it in a big plastic bag and we're throwing it out somewhere far, far away. Instead, we need that material to go back into our soil. So when we don't connect that, that becomes desertification. One third of our entire land surface on this earth is encountering desertification, which means that we're not able to use that soil properly because it's been stripped of all its natural nutrients. Um, so how can we counteract that you know, huge, huge impact? One option is composting, right? Putting it back into our soil. 
So we wanna take material from our food waste, our natural nutrients and put it back into the ground. Um, also compost is a natural organic fertilizer. Instead of relying on inorganic fertilizers or, or potential toxic pesticides or herbicides, we can use naturally occurring material, which we've used you know, historically before we even invented landfills and incinerators. Um, and this also can reduce the amount of material going into our landfills and our incinerators so we have more space and then it all goes back into our, our land surface. Also, the nutrients itself can really impact our soil. So it can help with uh, absorbing more water in our underground walk aquifers. It can reduce the amount of uh, negative pesticides, herbicides, negative um, toxic material that can impact our underground aquifers. And it can also reduce runoff. It could, do, it could absorb more material for higher quality products to grow, which is very exciting. So we wanna be able to close that loop. So we wanna take those banana peels and put it back into our ground so we can create more healthy soil to create more produce that can go back to our, our um, home. So we have a big soil food web. And so how can we do that now? So a little bit about what we do at Compost Brew. Um, we food scrap recycle. So we pick up food scraps from the local community um, and we take it to different locations to be composted. So one location is large scale facilities. So there's multiple ways to compost. One is in a large scale. So there's a picture here of a big windrow with a windrow turner. At a large scale facility, you can take a lot of material and break it down at a pretty rapid rate. Um, that's because there's big piles, high density, the temperatures and a good range so that I can break down. And also there's a lot of technology that's involved. So we make sure it's breaking down uh, accurately and efficient, efficiently. So for example, in Fairfax County close by, we have a, a large scale facility at Falls Ford, um, which is operated by Free State Farms. They have a technology where they use aerated static piles as well as some windrow material. And they break down their, their food scrap from one month to, to three months time before it cures and get, becomes finished compost. Um, there's also other ways to compost than a, just a large scale facility, right? we can also go to medium and small scale facilities. So not just in your backyard, we can also do it at local farms. So right now as a company, we are partnering with local farms to, to try to provide a smaller decentralized system of composting. So what does that mean? We can take composting closer to the large waste generators and we can create a smaller closed loop circle right? So instead of going to your residential home and then going far, far away to a large scale facility, we now can take it to a smaller facility that's close by and break it down naturally there and then put it back into our farms so that they can produce healthy soil. So now we've created a smaller closed loop circle while keeping all those nutrients that are beneficial for our environment, but also great for economics too, um, back to our local farmers. So right now you can see in this picture on the right, um, our on-farm system, we created our own um, aerated stack pile system and used shipping containers that we source locally from Baltimore, um, where we can force air in and produce high quality compost right there on the farm that can be utilized. And then instead of just farms and large scale facilities, we also have smaller scale facilities that we can do anywhere. So you can compost, if there's land, or even if there's not land, you can compost, right? Um, that could be in your backyard. It can be in a little vermicomposting bin in your apartment. It could be at a community garden or a school. Um, and those, those types of materials can, can all break down in the same way, just in a different, potentially different capacity um, and different time scale. So overall, composting helps build our community resilience. Instead of relying on a large, large landfill or incinerator far away, or instead of relying on just one or two large scale facilities, if we can take all of these ways of composting together, so on farm systems, large scale facilities, and small facilities like backyard and schools, if we take that all together, we're building community resilience so we always have a way of taking our food scraps and breaking it down for our soil and building our 
food, a soil food web. Um, this also is community engagement. You being here today is part of this community engagement, but we can continue to educate and learn more about how we can help our environment and our local farms and produce. And then from there, what can you do now today? So a lot of you have already food scrap recycling, a lot of you are already composting, but if you're not, you can do it right now. It's very easy in Fairfax County. So um, one way to start is just by separating. Even if it's going to a landfill or incinerator, if you start separating, you're starting to create that mindset of taking that material out of your, out of your trash bin into a different environment so that you can start seeing how easy it is and how much food waste is, is taking up your space and your trash. And then the next step was take that food scraps out of that bin and into a place where it can get composted. So for example, you can take it to a drop-off uh, if you don't compost at home right now. So that's a really easy way to get started. Um, there's a lot of different ways to do that. One, uh, Fairfax County offers two large drop-off locations um, that actually we service. So that's at the I-66 and I-95 transfer stations. Um, you can also take it to different farmers markets and also while you're there, help local businesses and produce farmers while you're at a farmer's market um, to drop off your food scraps. There's also places like commercial locations like Mom's Organic Market, um, which is a grocery store that offers food scrap drop off locations. Um, and if you don't have any of those, if you don't, you know, if you're already past that, you don't want to drive, you can also always compost at home or get with your community and try to find a way that you can compost with as a community garden or, or anywhere else. So there's a lot of different ways to compost. Um, you can see in this link here, this is a way in Fairfax County, you can access it right now. Um, a little bit as a company, what we're trying to do is we're trying to create more ways to compost in Fairfax County. So I'm actively, like Juan Pablo said, I'm actively working with the Urban Agricultural Working Group and a few different other organizations to try to expand regulation for composting so it's easier for all of us to be able to recycle our food scraps. Um, so that means we're looking for places to partner to create on-farm systems. So if you want to get start involved and you need help, please let us know. If you need, know a site that would be interested, please let us know. And if you ever want food scrap recycling right at your home, we also offer a curbside service where you can get a bin and you can compost right there. Um, so let us know if you have any questions there. Now I'm gonna hand it over to Ivy uh, to finish out our presentation. Ivy, thank you. Hi guys, could you hear me okay? Yes, awesome. So a little bit about compost science and the specifics of the compost science. Um, much like any other ecosystem, compost piles need a healthy balance of ingredients uh, in order for its organisms to thrive. So these four main or ingredients are, are greens. So these are materials rich in nitrogen. So these are our food scraps, our fresh uh, yard clippings and coffee grounds and our browns, which are our carbon source. And um, these are uh, like dry leaves, wood chips and wood shavings. Um, and it's important to keep these materials balanced um, in a compost pile. Um, and that would be done so through the CDN ratio, the carbon to nitro nitrogen ratio, um, which ideally is three to one. So for every one part uh, nitrogen, you want three parts carbon. And just like us, uh, microorganisms require plenty of water and oxygen in order to break down these materials. So we wanna make sure that the pile is well mixed and that no section of the pile is going anaerobic or can't be broken down properly um, in order to create a successful compost pile. So it might also be helpful to cap the pile um, with extra carbon, um, especially during the winter time to prevent maybe any nutrient loss um, and to hold in temperature, maybe even to prevent any potential pests. Um, and further to make more successful compost piles, you wanna reach a temperature of 131 degrees Fahrenheit. This is the temperature that's going to kill off any potential pathogens um, to humans, and it should be maintained for at least three consecutive days. Um, and we, we monitor these temperatures at our compost outposts. Um, and to kill off most weed seeds, we also need to reach temperatures of 145 degrees. Um, so typically you want your compost pile to be between 131 and 150 degrees during active composting. This is when microorganisms are, are at the height of their activity and they're respirating and creating a lot of heat. Um, but temperatures above 160 degrees can be damaging to those microorganisms. So we wanna keep it balanced. 
So what can you compost? Um, any food scraps or spoiled food can be composted as well as soiled paper products. So your pizza boxes that have grease on them, you can throw them in the compost bin or in the compost pile. Just make sure to tear them up so that they can break down more quickly. Um, but there are some materials that can or should only be composted at certain levels. So in a backyard composting system, it's recommended to never put in bones or meat or dairy products. These materials can introduce pests into a backyard system. Um, and uh, the backyard systems often don't reach temperatures high enough to fully break down things like bones. Um, does anyone know if animal products can be processed on an on-farm composting system? Yes, thumbs up if you agree. Yeah, so we can at Compost Crew and our on-farm composting systems, we can process animal products um, because we monitor these temperatures weekly and have pest control management um, in place. Um, something, another important thing to think about is compostable plastics. You may see these at local restaurants or coffee shops. Um, compostable plastics are a great step in the right direction away from regular plastics, but it is important to know that these plastics can only be composted at a commercial level. So they require grinding before being mixed into a pile and they therefore won't break down in a backyard compost pile or in small scale composting systems. However, Compost Crew does take compostable plastics. Um, we accept them, but we do send them to a commercial facility. So that's something, a big selling point about uh, Compost Crew is you can send um, compostable plastics to us. So as a rule of thumb, leave out any animal products and compostable plastics when recycling at home, but remember that uh, compostable plastics can be composted commercially. So best practices for food uh, scrap recycling, Obviously avoid putting anything non-organic like plastics or metals or toxins into your bin or pile. They won't break down and they might even leach chemicals. A common misunderstood material is wax or plastic lined paper. Although paper can be composted, we often see a lining on these uh, papers. Uh, this is pretty common in alternative milk and ice cream packaging. So always toss those in the garbage bin. Um, practice leaving liquids out as much as possible for drinks uh, or meals like soup. It's better to just put the liquid down the garbage disposal and put the solids in your compost bin or in your compost pile. And for wetter items like coffee grounds, you can reduce the amount of liquid by either letting them out uh, to dry or wrapping them in something like paper towels or newspaper that you were already planning on composting. There can be a lot of confusion on whether certain items are compostable or not, especially when they're made up of multiple materials, but we want to make food scrapping accessible and easy for everyone. So if you have any questions about whether something is compostable, um, feel free to reach out to your management of your neighborhood composting system or reach out to Compost Crew. We definitely want to make it accessible to everyone. Um, Compost Crew does all the dirty work, work of food scrap recycling, so there's really no ick factor involved. Our compost bins are gamma sealed and release no smells, and we offer weekly curbside pickup, so smells are never really an issue, and we want to celebrate um, composting and microorganism, in, microorganisms breaking down our food scraps. Um, finally, we just want to give a big thank you to everyone who's interested in composting. Our mission, obviously, is to make composting convenient and clean and easy for everyone, um, all while we're all fighting food waste. So thank you very much for having us. If anyone has any specific questions about composting, the drop-off program, a compost outpost, please feel free to reach out um, either at the end of this uh, workshop or you could reach out via our um, email here on the screen. So thanks again. Um, thank you, uh, Christy and Ivy. Um, I guess if there were any specific questions regarding compost crew, um, maybe we'll take a minute to, if anybody has a, a question, you can put it in the chat or, or just ask the question. Um, someone raised their hand, but I can't see who it is. I have a question. Yes, Karen. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so with composting, you need liquid. You need the water to be in there to make it all work. So why would you need to take the water out of, uh, say, like coffee filter? Yeah, so I'll answer that. That was mostly for food scrap recycling, not for the composting side. So for example, if you're just taking food scraps to a drop-off space, 
or if you have it on your curbside, we recommend if it's too liquidy, it might break through the bag that you're using or make it a little bit messy. That's the only reason. Of course, you definitely want so much water in your backyard composting or when we're on farm composting or in your community. So definitely you need water for that. So that's mostly was just for the food scrap recycling side. So I hope that okay, answers thank you. your question. Yeah. So if you live in a cul-de-sac community where there may be a hundred maybe a hundred homes on our cul-de-sac, how many would you recommend we try to get signed up to do like a community curbside pickup? Yeah, so we do community discounts. So if you had as a minimum 15 people, we can automatically give a discount to our usual services. So really, if anyone wants to start, sign up, even if it's one person, they can sign up right now at our website um, for curbside services. Um, but if all 100 does it, then it becomes almost half the cost or even more so um, depending on how people are involved. Um, so if you feel if you're interested in starting a community program, feel free to reach out to us via email um, or phone and we can de definitely discuss those specifics with you. So I hope that answered your question. Thank you. Okay. Um, like I said, we'll have time at the end to ask a few more questions. Um, but now we're going to move on to Leanne Lindsay. Uh, she is uh, has been gardening since she was a child in Alabama and also in uh, Western United States and Northern Ireland, England, where she's lived. Uh, she's composted at home for over 25 years um, and incorporated worms into her composting about 20 years ago. Uh, she's also a Fairfax County Master Gardener, uh, and uh, I think my favorite part of her thing, she is the daughter and granddaughter of worm composters. Uh, so thank you, uh, Leanne, for, for joining us today, and we look forward to learning a little bit more about worm composting. Well, thanks for inviting me. So thanks for, um, thanks for inviting me. I, I do love to talk about worms, and my family's pretty tired of it. Um, in this picture, I would be the person on the on the right who is clapping, not the person on the left. I think worms do a great job, and I encourage anybody to um, to start composting with worms. Um, why would you want to compost with worms? Hold on just a second. Let me do this. I'm trying to work with two screens. Why do you want to compost with worms? Well, um, when you compost with worms, you can dispose uh, responsible of your kitchen waste and your paper waste. I use a lot of my shredded computer paper in with my worms. I also have a second shredder that I use to dispose of um, um, things like uh, cereal boxes and cookie boxes, and I shred those up and the worms will just love them and they'll make a lot of them. They make a very valuable compost. And besides that, my HOA won't let me raise goats or pigs or anything else. So it's just worms, not even bees. I can't even raise bees. So worms it is, and I love them. Um, I really encourage anybody who's thinking about it to start raising your worms indoors first. That may sound counterintuitive, because once again, people go worms, ick, but this is a really good way to start. Um, what you're looking at here, there are all different kinds of ways of doing this now. Um, it used to be if you wanted to do this inside, you'd have to make your own and, and be thought of as kind of an oddball. Well, maybe that's still true, but anyway, um, these are some really good, good ways to start raising your worms. They have directions. I suggest if you do this, you follow your directions first. Some of what I tell you tonight may differ slightly, but that's because I've been doing this for a long time. When you start, follow the directions and, you know, you'll figure out where you can sort of wing it as you go along and you get successful. Um, once again, bedding, uh, newspapers are fine. I haven't used newspapers with my worms in 15 years because I have so much shredded uh, computer paper and shredded um, cereal boxes. So that's what I use for my bedding. When you begin to feed them, you're going to put the bedding down. You're going to add the feeding. You're going to put more bedding on top to cover that food up. That's just something to remember. What do you feed them? Basically, you feed them. It's the same rules for, for worms that it is for um, compost with a few few differences. You do need to limit your coffee grounds. You don't, you can add a lot in, but not all at once. That's something you, you want to avoid doing is having too many at one time because um, that can put them off. 
Um, you don't want to feed them onions, spicy peppers, twigs, meat, dairy, or oil. It won't hurt them. They just won't do anything with it. And then you'll be left with a mess. Same thing with citrus. You can feed them some citrus. You can feed them some bread, starches, and desserts. But if you feed them too much, they just won't need it. And then you're stuck with that mess. So avoid that. Um, you can't use earthworms to, um, to process food. They, that's not what they do. Earthworms are way down deep and they will process the soil and they'll aerate it, but they won't take care of waste. You want red wigglers. Um, there are some other ones, but I'm just sticking with red wigglers tonight because we're not going to go down that rabbit hole. Um, red wigglers will eat about a half a pound of food for every pound of red wigglers that you have. Um, and if they like the way you're taking care of them, they will sing and dance like rabbits. Um, here's kind of what the worm tower looks like. And you can see that it's in different levels. So the way this works, you're first going to do your research and find the one that fits to you and you're going to follow the directions on the one it works but you start out with one level you put your your um newspaper in it you or whatever you're using your shredded paper you feed the worms a little bit in one corner and you cover that with newspaper and you put the the worms in another corner and you wait and you watch them when they start processing through that and you start getting worm castings and it fills in you start with the next layer and keep doing that. When you get to this top layer, you lift these off and take this one out, harvest your worms and your, and your um, castings, and then clean it up and put it back on the top layer. And that's why those are so good. You just keep going around and around. And this sort of gives you a side view. This is one of the, like an older one that would have been made, um, uh, you know, something that you put together, but that gives you an idea of the kind of levels you're talking about and what you're working with. Now, there is a difference between worm tea and leachate, and it's an important difference. Um, leachate is what's going to what's going to drain out of the bottom of your worm tower, and if you don't have a drain in the bottom of your worm tower, it is not a good worm tower. You need a way to drain that stuff out. Um, worm tea is what happens when everything's done and you've gotten your castings and you've separated your worms out and you put those castings in a pillowcase and tie that off and you dunk that in about a gallon of water for up 24, 12 to 24 hours, take that out, um, use all that worm tea, you can use it again. You can keep using that same pillowcase until that water starts to get too light. And then you take what's left in that pillowcase and dump it somewhere in your garden that you love. Leachate is what's draining off of that tower the whole time those worms are in there and active. The thing is, you don't know if it's draining out of the worm or if it's draining from the, the um, uh, breakdown of the food. So you don't know what pathogens are in it. So with the leachate, I do drain it off and I take it outside and I pour it on around in the ground of some of my inside plants or I'll pour it in my compost. But I then wash my hands very carefully because I just don't know what's in it. I would never um, put it in a sprayer and I would never put it on indoor plants. And I don't use it on my garden plants. I only use it on my um, uh, ornamentals. Um, so, and you can look up more information about that. That was a really quick explanation, but you can get more information. Um, so this is kind of what your, the inside of the tower looks like when it's ready. That's a bad picture on the left. Sorry about that. But that you can have a lot of worms in there. Um, but and, and you're going to get them out. And this is kind of what it looks like. If you've done it right, there shouldn't be much of a smell in there um, because you're going to you're going to still make sure that your worms get enough uh, green food and enough brown food that you don't get that anaerobic um, smell that comes out of there. But this is what it looks like when it's ready. When it gets to that point, you're going to separate your worms. Now, this is my least favorite part of it. I don't enjoy this part. And this is a little drawing of how you should do that. And that's a really, really good way to do it, but it's a lot like work. So the way I do it is a little bit different. I will take my little worm um, towers and I found a sh uh, um, sweater box that the lip of my worm tower just fits on top of with about three inches of space 
underneath that warm tower to the bottom of that uh, sweater box. And then I take my worms outside in that and I put them in a very bright spot and they'll crawl down from their, um, from that level that to, you know, what, what I'm talking, the section of the worm tower into the, sh the sweater box. And then there may be one or two um, slow ones left in the top. I'll rake through with a, usually a plastic fork and get those out. And then I've got all my worm castings. That is still work, but it's not as much work as this. But you know, you should research how to do that. There's a lot of different ways. There's not one right way to do it. And then you should do whatever way works for you. Um, you use the warm castings about the same way that you do um, anything, to any other regular compost. Once again, not the leachate. We're talking about the warm tea and the castings. You can mix them with seedlings. Um, you can put them when you're transplanting vegetables. You can put them in the hole when you're planting shrubs or, shrubs or trees. You can put worm castings down in there with it. You usually should dilute them um, a little bit, not just pure. It's be like giving cream to a baby if you just put pure worm castings into it. But you're going to dilute them enough so that um, so that you don't make your little vegetables sick. Um, hanging baskets love them. And if I end up at the end of the season and have a lot of, of warm castings left, I'll throw them in a sieve and just walk across the lawn shaking that sieve into the grass and the grass likes that as well. Um, that's pretty much how to raise worms in a thumbnail. Um, there's probably, I, I didn't cover everything. There's a lot to it, but that'll get you started. Um, don't hesitate. I've had a couple of wormageddons at my house and survived them. Um, there's always a couple of worms left. And um, if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Thank you for your time and attention. Uh, thank you so much, Leanne. Um, yeah, and I liked one thing you said that there's no one right way to do it. No. Um, and that's definitely true for compost. Um, and now I wanna introduce Janelle Welch. Uh, she and her husband have been growing uh, their own vegetables in their backyard now for about eight seasons. Uh, she's an avid recycler of everything uh, and kind of new to compost, um, but uh, she's been doing it about, about two years and wants to share. Um, I also wanna do a little shout out to Janelle. She helped design our flyer. Um, she's also a member of the Urban Ag Group. So thank you, uh, Janelle, for taking the time to talk to us today and also for all your work with our um, flyers for this uh, series of workshops. Thank you, Juan Pablo. Hi, everybody. Um, I have a really short presentation. Um, like Juan Pablo said, I'm relatively new to composting. I'm gonna, um, I'm relatively new to composting and I was hesitant to start because um, I thought it would stink and, you know, the, the typical arguments that you have, you know, it was going to stink and attract pests and bugs, um, but that is not, has not been my experience at all. Um, and uh, if you see on the right here, that's the compost bin that we have. It's a plastic uh, store-bought compost bin. It's got a little bit of a drawer at the bottom that you can raise up and take some compost out. Um, I, I'm not sure that I would actually purchase this one again because it is hard to get that drawer back down and get a tight seal on the ground um, and kind of shove everything back in. <laughs> so um, I think I might go a route, uh, a different route and maybe just, you know, wait until the compost is, is completely ready and take it out of the top. Um, and then on the other side of the screen is the uh, crock that I have on the kitchen counter, on my kitchen counter. And that's where I put in all of my um, uh, vegetable scraps, um, you know, carrot peels, potato peels, um, all of that kind of thing. Let's see if I can go down. Um, and these are the sort of things that I put inside of our compost bin. Um, as the compost crew gal said, you know, carbons and nitrogens are very important. Um, and we put dried mulch, um, leaves, shredded newspaper, shredded junk mail, nothing that's coated, coated paper. Um, and then kitchen scraps is mostly veggie scraps, um, garden plant 
clippings, used coffee grounds. Um, and then some of you may have already heard the lasagna, <laughs> the lasagna, layer it like a lasagna. Um, that is what we do inside of the bin is I put down um, a layer of our kitchen scraps and then I'll put down a layer of uh, dried leaves, um, newspaper and kind of like layer um, the carbons and the nitrogens all together um, in the bin. And then um, the air and the moisture um, is important. And we have this really cool thing. It's a great job if, uh, for the kiddos. If you have kids, it's called a compost spinner. And because I was having a really hard time turning the bin, it's kind of tall, it's tall and skinny. So this is um, a little spinner that you put in and you, and you put one hand um, on the one handle and the other hand spins around and it just mixes everything up and aerates it really nice. And um, we do that probably every couple weeks just to get everything mixed up in there. Um, and then of, of course the water, um, we have to make sure there's enough water and kind of by trial and error, um, I've learned too much moisture does make it a little stinky. So, um, you know, I, I always try to add, you know, shredded up newspaper. If I, if I look in there and it, and it feels like it's getting too, too wet, um, and then I'll take my, you know, garden glove and um, scoop up um, a mixture of the of the compost. And um, it's always the, you know, good if you can make like a, a nice firm meatball and it doesn't like water is it oozing out between your fingers and it's just like a kind of nice firm um, stick together Italian meatball <laughs> type of thing. Um, and then these are the things that um, food trial and error and you know things that I've read online and um, people have told me <laughs> these are the things that we do not put in uh, our composter. Um, uh, we, we did um, make the mistake of putting in I think too we drink a lot of coffee in our in our house because um, I work from home so um, I, I had way too much coffee grounds in there at one time and it's just um, like Juan Pablo said, it's very artisanal and it's kind of trial and error and you just kind of, you know, put something in and see what it does and, um, you know, um, just you kind of kind of have to figure it out um, yourself. Uh, and then down below the compost, the sad little composter, um, I put um, where I purchased this composter um, and then the great compost spinner. Um, that we have is by um, lowtechproducts.com. And um, that's pretty much all I have, just short and sweet. Cool, thank you, Janelle. We can tell you're the designer and the group here with that <laughs> nice presentation. Um, all right, we're gonna definitely do uh, some questions, but I, had, I wanted to show you my composting, um, what I do at home. Um, all right. Um, yeah, artisanal composting. Uh, I love compost because it's like a, a perfect loop system. Um, you get all your food scraps and then you put them in your compost pile and then you get really nice soil and then that soil you use in your, you know, raised beds if you're uh, a gardener and then uh, all the extra stuff from your vegetables, then that goes back into your compost. Um, and it's just this like perfect little circle. Um, and um, I think there's few things that are that efficient uh, in life and in nature, um, or nature, I guess, is very efficient. Um, and so, yeah, um, I've just been always for the last maybe like 10 or 15 years, just a big uh, fan of composting. Um, and then why do I compost? Well, I like making my own fertilizer. Uh, I'm kind of cheap, don't like buying things. Uh, and so if I can make my own compost uh, for my growing season, I like that. Um, I like to separate my trash. I feel, you know, I don't like... If you roll out your cans, you don't want the smelly food mixed in with all the rest of your trash. It's just not how it's designed to be. Um, and I do like it too, because I feel like I do my part. Uh, you know, we see all this stuff going on in the world and we want to figure out how we can be proactive in doing our part. Um, and I feel like composting is, is just like a perfect, easy way that we can and I kind of pitch in. Um, and uh, similar to what Janelle was saying is just the watching and learning. Um, I love just kind of like, depending on the time of the year, it's more active or less active. Um, and I love just kind of like dumping in all my compost and then watching it 
uh, you know, maybe sometimes within a week, everything I dumped the week before, it's just kind of like disappeared. Um, and I just kind of like that process of like watching and observing and, and learning um, uh, how, how composting works and, and all the little variables that affect um, your compost. Um, this is, um, yeah, another picture. Uh, under our sink, we keep this, this bucket. Um, and this is where we put all our compost. Um, I put it in that picture because usually I'm reminded by my wife uh, where it's starting to smell. And she's like, you need to go dump this outside. Um, and so that's when I do it. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, we just keep that in. It include, it keeps it, you know, we've, I've never had any issues with flies or anything inside the house. Um, and usually once a week, Saturday mornings, I'll, I'll go outside and, and dump it. Um, the green stuff. So yeah, all the, all the food coming out of our garden, out of our kitchen is our main ingredient. Um, but I love adding green uh, grass clippings as well. Uh, I have a lawnmower. I stick my bag in the in the lawnmower, and then I collect all the all the grass, and that really fires up my compost um, with all that green material. Um, and it's something that, you know, um, yeah, you can lawn mow and just let your grass clippings fall, and they will decompose in your on, on your on your on your backyard, um, but I also like collecting some of it and using it in, in my compost. Uh, and then my brown stuff, um, I like just raking up my leaves in the garden, which we all have plenty of, uh, and I kind of do the same thing. I run the lawnmower over my leaves um, that shreds them and collects them into a bag, and I have maybe like three or four of these black big black buckets, and I just dump all the shredded leaves into that. And as I need it, um, I can just grab it from my buckets and add it into my, my composting space. Um, a few other things that I, I, I grow is like uh, our egg cartons. Um, I'm very specific about the type of egg cartons we should buy, uh, which are the ones that can be composted. Um, and then, you know, I always, we always have a fireplace going. Uh, we love having a fire pit outside. And so I usually clean all the ashes and, and all that stuff, and I mix that in with my compost as well. Um, this is a uh, location. Um, so at home as, as well, uh, you know, uh, not everyone is a compost believer. And so I had to convince that this was not going to attract uh, pests into our garden and it wasn't going to look or smell bad. And so I found this cool spot behind these bushes uh, under these trees. Uh, and so if you can see where the arrow is pointing behind those bushes, that's where I, that's where our compost space is, uh, which is nice. We can sit outside, we can be in our backyard, and you can't tell that our compost um, space is in there. And so I have to walk behind the bushes, and then I can go and dump it. And so, um, yeah, it's kind of nice because it's, it's outside, but it's out of sight, um, so I can't, you know, upset anyone else in our household. Um, this is kind of what it looks like. Uh, this is probably the most artisanal compost of anyone presenting today. Um, I found two pallets on the side of the road. I leaned them up against the two trees. They're not nailed or bolted or anything. They're just kind of leaning up against the trees. Um, and basically I just started putting a pile down on the ground uh, and adding leaves and adding food scraps. Um, and um, yeah, I keep my pitchfork right there. Um, because it's under this like canopy of trees, it gets a little bit of rain, but it doesn't get like poured on ever. Um, even with the snow a couple of weeks ago, it was, you know, it kept a lot of the snow out of it. Um, and uh, yeah, and so it's just very easy. I just come in, uh, I dig a hole in the middle, I dump all my compost in it. If I feel like there's a lot and it's kind of like icky looking, then that's when I grab a handful or two of shredded brown leaves and I mix it in it and I kind of mix that in in the hole and then I cover it back up. Um, we like putting flowers in our house as well and that's something we always add in our in our compost um, space. Um, this is my uh, um, that always makes me kind of mad uh, despite you know like having done this for many years and really you know convincing our household that this is good and important you'll always find uh, um, food scraps in the trash can. Um, and, you know, I'm always like, okay, all right, I'll, I'll put it back in our trash can. Um, and then sometimes you'll find it in the compost bin, but they forget to take the sticker off. Um, I'm sure the big uh, compost crew people can uh, relate. I'm sure there's a lot of stickers uh, going on <laughs> in that one. Um, hopefully one day they'll figure out a way that we can purchase food without having to put a sticker on every single thing. Um, but that's one that I think we at home still kind of have to troubleshoot all the time. 
Um, and this one, um, this is kind of like very basic rules that I follow in my my garden. Um, I always say kind of follow your your nose. Uh, if it smells, just add brown material. Just mix in more brown material. Uh, if there's flies or you know you can see that it just doesn't look like a, um, it doesn't. It, yeah, you can see flies or things flying around it. Same thing. Just add a little bit more brown material. Um, if you feel like your compost is slow and it's not breaking down as fast as you would hope so, um, adding more green material and then turning it more regularly. So I usually do it just once a week, but I bet if I came in maybe two or three times a week and just kind of turned it, um, it would um, it would break down a lot faster. Uh, and last, uh, rain. Um, like I said, I found a nice space to kind of cover it up with just the canopy from the trees. But if not, you can just put a tarp over it and that'll keep some of the moisture, keep some of the heat and it'll actually help break the break the compost down. Um, and that is all I've got. Um, yeah, so like I said, just very basic. Um, I didn't, we didn't have to buy anything. I don't have the cool gadgets that Janelle has on her compost. Um, but it really works. And about every spring, I just collect all that stuff, uh, dig a hole in my raised bed and kind of bury it a little bit because not everything has broken down. Um, and yeah, I've just had an awesome growing season every, every year since. Um, so we have a couple more minutes and we definitely want to give everyone the opportunity to ask questions. Um, so I'm going to start with Eugenia. Hi. So we have a bear in our neighborhood. Um, and like the last couple of springs and summers, we've had a bear come visit. We live in Northern Virginia. So I'm committed to composting, but I am not committed to the bear coming to visit. So um, while I want to kind of, you know, have the outdoor space, I, I think a container would be better for our family, right? That a container is kind of more appropriate to abate the bear coming to visit my family. <laughs> yes, uh, I would give you two options. Uh, obviously, uh, you could have like a worm compost that you could have indoors, um, like Leanne was showing you. Um, or the other is maybe uh, getting compost crew service um, and that way, you're doing your part composting, but you're not necessarily having to deal with a with a bear in your backyard. That is that is quite the quite the challenge. Um, but yeah, uh, Felicia. No, uh, Denise. So can you also just say I get a lot of slugs in my compost and is that good, helpful, anything that I need to do for that? Good question. Uh, I've never had slugs in my compost, Adria, or anyone um, have any thoughts on that? So I have it as a container, if that helps. I have it in like a big Rubbermaid container, so it has a lid on it, and there's holes and things like that. So I do get worms that kind of go, but then the slugs always seem to get on the top of the, the lid. Are you, are you able to just pull those slugs out and... Or are you finding that there's slug eggs in there? I mean, because if they're they're laying their eggs in there, maybe you could just kind of remove them. Um, certainly, you don't want to add slugs to your garden. Um, there are some things you can do. You could put like wet newspaper a little bit on top of that container, and then they'll be attracted to that wet newspaper or even just a little bit of like a small board, and then you can pick them off. Or if they're just kind of sticking to the top of that container, I would just pull them off and remove them and dispose of them. Okay. Okay. Thank you. All right. Yeah, and I also like to say you can just add a little bit more carbon. Um, I don't recommend like using anything toxic because they are honestly really good for the environment. They're really not bad to have in your compost pile in certain ways. Um, so just adding a little bit more carbon, having the green material a little bit more covered also helps with things like that. Cool, thank you. Uh, Jan? Uh, it's Jean, hi, thanks. Jean, sorry. Um, how, how much do I have to chop the food up before I throw it in? D does it matter? Um, in my experience, it doesn't really matter, but like smaller pieces will break down faster. Um, and so I think, if you're, you know, chopping something and you want to discard it, maybe giving it a few more chops um, just to kind of speed up the process of breaking it down. 
I've put um, a whole, you know, um, a whole um, half of a watermelon rind in there. And, you know, I guess it just depends on what kind of food it is too, because watermelon rinds, I mean, they'll disappear really quick. So it just depends on how tough and fibrous the, the food waste is. Uh, Andrew? Yes, does, does anybody, so I, I live in an apartment by myself and I, I really don't have anywhere to compost outside, but has anybody had any experience with the, for a lack of a better term, it's a compost appliance. Like it sort of sits on your counter and it, it, it grinds up everything and it heats it up. I'm not sure if, if that's really a viable option, if anybody has any experience, good, bad, or indifferent. Yeah, Over. I'll jump into this one if you don't mind. Um, so great question. There are a lot of new technologies coming out for composting. Um, there's certain things like the Lomi I've heard of, and there's a bunch of other things like that. Um, those types of appliances, I just don't like that they call it compost. Um, it's very easy to say, if anyone says something could break down in like a day or a week, it is not compost. <laughs> That's not the end point of it. Um, so I think those types of things are great if you want to break down your material, you generate a lot of food scraps, you don't wanna take it out a lot, you wanna break it down, and then you can add it to a compost pile. Um, so I still wouldn't put that, since you're in an apartment, you're not putting it really anywhere, but I would still bring it to a comp place to get finished to be composted. Um, I do think it's a little bit of a waste of money in an apartment just because you're not really accelerating the process for your own composting. It's really, you're accelerating it for maybe us or the, uh, like a large scale facility. So I recommend either just taking that material and just the fresh material itself and then taking it to a drop off or um, a, a bin, like we can, we can service apartments um, or vermicomposting in your, in your apartment if you're interested in versus something like that. Um, I'll let anybody else talk about those, but my little read about it. Um, yeah, I've been suspicious of like the claim. <laughs> um, I see them on my Instagram feeds all the time. Uh, it looks cool, but it does, I think, uh, at least the one I've seen is a little over $300, um, which seems a little excessive, um, but good question. Uh, Cecile Gonzalez. Thank you for that, by the way. Thank you. Yeah, hi. Um, thank you for holding this event. I, I was just wondering, um, do you ever or how often do you test the nutrients levels in your compost um, like to make sure they're balanced or not, you know, higher than, than they should be for using in your yard? Um, I will say never. Uh, in my case, I've never done that. Um, I, I think once you spend a little time with compost, you kind of like, I, you can kind of identify just by touch and smell what like good soil is like. Um, but um, Christine, I don't know if you guys do something a little more technical. Yeah, so for regulation base, um, you, and if you, for example, sell compost, so if you're making it and you're selling it, you're required to test it four times the first year. So it's verified and then it's once time per year you test for non-organics and you do for organics um, in different ways. There's a big list for it. Um, but if you're doing it at home in your backyard, there are really easy ones to test that aren't very expensive. So for example, if you wanna do it the first time, I recommend getting those pH strips. pH is really important um, for material getting breaking down. You want it to, everything to be natural, like ambient air temperature. Like for example, if you wanna check temperature, which is really important. You can even use one of your little meat thermometers that you might have for cooking. And you can even check it with that, um, which is kind of fun. Um, you can also use pH strips, just making sure it's around seven um, is what you would like ideally. Um, things like that are really easy. If you are really worried beforehand, you can do a quick test um, for some basic nutrients, about like 70 bucks if you want to send it in. But like Juan Pablo said, a lot of times you'll know if it's nutritious or not based on how your your nutrients and your um, plants are growing. Um, there's a lot of ways you can test it like on tomato plants and things like that. So uh, there's a lot of cool strategies for at home, but that's what we do. We do um, once per year at a minimum. Okay, uh, I think we have time for maybe two more questions. Tor Landa, Archer. No? 
Can I? She's mute. Uh, she is muted. But can I ask a quick question? This is Felicia Stankovic. Can Please. you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, if you just uh, chose to comp uh, compost with uh, leaves and grass, would that work? I think so. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, you kind of what you want to do is keep that ratio of like three parts brown to one part green. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and um, yeah, but you can definitely just compost. I mean, that's that's basically what happens on the forest floor, right? It's just all those materials kind of breaking down over time. So yeah, and you can definitely another do that. Question. And adding a grounds, would that make the compost acidic? Somehow I think adding coffee grounds would acidify that uh, mixture. Um, um, if I was just going to add, if you if you use the coffee grounds and the water goes through the coffee grounds, it's you know it's not as acidic. If you put used coffee grounds, that's what I've heard. Used coffee grounds. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank and you. I think it depends on the amount too. Kind of like how we mentioned, if if you start going to you know Starbucks and picking up their coffee yeah. grounds and then putting them in your house that yeah. might definitely um change the composition of your compost but if it's just your small daily amounts um i think you should be fine okay thank you thank you um and then last i think sue if you're still around um do you have a question for us um yes actually oh, i can't see myself um i i um tried trench composting where I would just dig a trench and bury my food scraps and I noticed that critters would dig them up. But um, I know somebody that would do, they just bought a, um, a cheap blender and blended up their, their scraps and then did a um, trench composting where they put shredded paper and the food scraps that they you know, blend it and put it, in, you know, directly into the soil. Is that something that, I mean, I haven't tried that. Is that something that would work? Um, I think so. Yeah. And that would kind of help, like we mentioned, that part of if things are broken down into smaller pieces um, would help speed up, speed up the process. Um, I've definitely, whenever I, I put in a new raised bed in the spring, um, I'll do that sometimes as well, where I'll, like some of the bottom layers of my raised bed will have more uh, not broken down food scraps um, and then layer stuff on top. Um, uh, but yeah, I've, I've actually always wanted a, some sort of food grinder or something just to kind of speed up the process. So if you can do that, that's, that's definitely a good idea. Okay, thank you. Cool. Oh, hi. Right. This is Torlanda. I didn't get a chance to ask the question. May Go I? ahead. Yes, of so course. So the question, well, I wanted to clear, clarification about the um, animals. Um, is it uh, cats or, or pets attracted to the compost, especially like the lasagna? And um, the other part would be, um, and not attracted to newspaper and the uh, leaves. Yeah, so I would say in um, in Janelle's presentation, because she has that container, that really helps to keep, you know, most critters out. Um, and the way I have it, just kind of like a, a pile outside. Um, my dog, I would say, is my biggest, uh, my biggest pest. Uh, I'll open the door so she can go outside and then I can't find her. And she's like, sure enough, like digging in the, in the compost, trying to eat stuff. Um, but um, yeah, um, part of it is like, I think once you have like a very active decomposition thing going um, and you can add your brown stuff in there uh, that tends to help and keep uh, critters away um, if you're starting some of the other examples of the worm tower and uh, and the other kind of like contained compost might be a, a better way to go uh, till as you learn you know kind of like how to how to work your compost um, I don't awesome. know if I've just gotten lucky but I yeah um, aside from my dog, I don't, I've never seen other critters kind of like rummaging through my compost. Also, I wanted to mention with the lasagna oh. method, the layering method, if you end up with um, always putting the carbons on top, it cuts down on the pest. Um, so you don't end with the, with the, 
food scraps, always put a layer of leaves on top of your food scraps and as you're layering your compost lasagna. <laughs> yeah. So that okay. helps cut down on pests as well. All right, so thank you. Just, just to also to just add, um, one of the reasons I, I got back into worm composting um, as an adult was one of my first compost piles did get visited by things. And so I decided that instead of putting my um, food scraps out in that compost pile, I would run it through the worms first and then put the worm castings in the compost pile. And that way things, if you've just got leaves and paper and uh, grass and uh, worm castings in your compost pile, you don't get visited by bears. Not for that reason. <laughs> all right, good, thank you. Um, okay, uh, all right, Lorraine, I saw you had your hand up. Um, I think we might do the last one, but this would be the last one. Sure, thank you. Can we get copies of the um, slides that were presented tonight? Yeah, so uh, Aid, you're correcting me if I'm wrong, but we will, um, We've recorded uh, tonight's session and then it'll go up on our Fairfax uh, Food Council website. Is that correct? Yes, we'll, we'll be able to provide the link on the website. Just give us a couple days because a lot of volunteers help me get the link together. Uh, it's very much uh, supported by Virginia Cooperative Extension, the Zoom and everything and the registration system. And a lot of it is the, the master gardeners who have helped us and all the volunteers tonight, all of the people who are joining us as presenters are volunteering as well. Um, so we, we really uh, uh, probably take a, a few days to get it all together. And what is that website? Um, we can send it out to all of the people who registered for the class. Thank you. And we'll, we'll send the link out once it pre it's prepared. And then we can also post the recording um, on the fairfaxcounty.gov. And then just, I think it's like Fairfax Food Council, Urban Ag Work Group. You'd have to click through that uh, or just search that. So Fairfax Food Council, the Urban Agriculture Work Group. Thank you. Okay. All right. Um, wonderful. Thank you, uh, everyone. Um, uh, compost crew, thank you for uh, taking the time and talking to us. Um, hopefully some of the people on this call will uh, be uh, inspired and motivated to compost at home or either hire your services to, to be uh, to compost. Um, we really appreciate uh, Leanne uh, and Janelle and Adria's time as well uh, for today. Um, just a quick reminder, we have another workshop two weeks from today on the 15th um, and um, that one will be about spring garden. Um, and so we'll have kind of the same uh, dynamic. We'll have a presenter and then we'll have a few people kind of give a few uh, cool tips on, on gardening in, in Fairfax County. Um, so if, if you're still interested, please register for that one. Um, and uh, if you have any Spanish speaking friends or family members, uh, or yourself if you wanna practice your Spanish. Tomorrow, we're basically having the same uh, sort of workshop, uh, compost crew. We didn't invite compost crew for the Spanish one, but uh, I didn't ask if you spoke Spanish. <laughs> um, but uh, we'll have it tomorrow at seven as well. And you can also uh, register or tell other people to register. Um, but yeah, we'll be having a composting in Spanish um, pr presentation tomorrow. Um, that's all for today. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time. Uh, and uh, we hope um, to see you in future workshops uh, and hopefully, um, yeah, we can keep composting and gardening uh, in Fairfax County.